You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. So we're going to read on page 1160. Anybody know where that's at? <laughs> Daniel chapter 11. We're going to go, we're going to read verses 36 through the end of the chapter. And then because we will be referring to it fairly regularly over the next five verses, I would like to read all of Ezekiel 38 and 39 this morning. Um, and it's far more important than anything I have to say anyway. So, so turn with me to Daniel chapter 11 and we'll read from verse 36 through the end of chapter 11. Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god, speaking of the Antichrist, and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods, and he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. And he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show any regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. And he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. And he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him. And he will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price. And at the end time, the king of the south will collide with him. And the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen and with many ships. And he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land, and many countries will fall. But these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, And Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and and annihilate many. And he will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. And then if you will, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 38. These prophecies have great bearing on the book of Daniel, book of Revelation, uh, Zechariah, uh, in, indeed the entire scripture. But for our purposes this morning, I think it's good to have this at least working around in the background of our minds as we, as we take, 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 uh, take ourselves through the next five verses of Daniel chapter 11. So Ezekiel chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog and the prince of Rush, Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your armies, all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Togamesh, Beth Togama, excuse me, from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be summoned. In the latter years you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations into the mountains of Israel, which had been continual waste, but its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living serenely, all of them. Remember that, living at peace, living serenely or securely. I think I need new glasses. And you will go up. You will come like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, and you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest, that live securely. 
all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates, and capture spoil and to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited, and against the people who are gathered from the nations, who have acquired cattle and goods, who live at the, the center of the world, speaking of Israel. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages will say to you, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, and to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture great spoil? Therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel are living securely, will you not know it? And you will come from your place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will come about in the last days that I shall bring you up against my land in order that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified through you before their eyes, O Gog. Thus says the Lord Gog, are you, one of, are you the one of whom I spoke in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them? And it will come about on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. And in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day, there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. And the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the fields, the, the beasts of the field, all of the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will also also will be thrown down, the steep pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. And I shall call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and with pestilence and with blood I shall enter in ju into judgment with him, and I shall rain on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. Chapter 39. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. And I shall turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And I shall strike your bow from your left hand, and dash down your arrows from your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, and you and all your troops, and, all the, and the peoples who are with you. I shall give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open field, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. And they will know that I am the Lord. And my holy name I shall make known in the midst of my people Israel. And I shall not let my holy name be profaned any more. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is coming and it shall be done, declares the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears. And for seven years they will make fires of them. And they will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires with the weapons. And they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. And it will come to pass, and it will come about on that day, that I, I shall give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by the east, by east of the sea, and it will block off the passers-by. So they will bury Gog there with all his multitude, and they will call it the valley of Hamangog. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the people of the land will bury them, and it will be to their renown on the day that I glorify myself declares the Lord God. And they will set apart men who will constantly pass through the land, burying those who were passing through, even those left on the surface of the ground, in order to cleanse it. And at the, at the end of seven months, they will make a search. And as those who pass through the land pass through and anyone sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. And even the name of the city will be Hamona. So they will cleanse the land. And as for you, son of man, Thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and every beast of the field, assemble and come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. 
You shall eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted and drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. And you will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. And I shall set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. And the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me, and I hid my face from them. So I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions. I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I shall restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I shall be jealous for my holy name, and they shall forget their disgrace and all their treachery which they perpetrated against me when they lived when they lived securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid. When I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I shall be sanctified through them in the sight of many nation, of the many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations, and then gathered them again to their own land, and I will leave none of them there any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I have, for I have shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. So a couple of things just to remember. Remember the phrase, Israel will be living securely, but will be living in peace, at rest. That comes up in our section Remember that when God decides to, at the end of the indignation, when Israel finally looks and sees their Messiah whom they pierced, he will bring them back into their land. This is a real bringing back into a real land with real borders. It's not a metaphysical statement. Israel will take possession. And that is important. (laughs) Further, those times are going to be the worst of times and then become, and I'm not quoting some book I just thought about in my head. <laughs> they will be the worst of times, but they will become, because of the hand of Jehovah, they will become the best of times. We're going to be looking at some horrible times that are coming for Israel and for the world. And, and the, the language that is used, God uses to give us a picture of how bad it is, it takes seven months to bury the people. With our modern technology... Think about how amazing that must be. They will not have to use the, the trees of the forest for their energy because a third by this time, a third of the forest will have burned down. So this plays into other prophecies. But they will have, and, and also they will have plenty to use uh, through the, the war engines that came against Israel. And remember that Daniel, Ezekiel, all of the prophets of old used the language of their time. If they had described the weapons that were used in modern language, the language we understand, the Israelites, all of the ancients would not have understood what they were saying. So that plays into this as well. This section of Daniel, uh, the last section of chapter 11, which actually doesn't finish until about chapter 5, excuse me, verse 5 of, of chapter 12, is speaking of the end, the end time. Um, This is not Antiochus Epiphanes. This is the Antichrist. This is a great and momentous time of the end. And I'm thinking that it's going to get really bad here on planet Earth. Uh, I'm not saying that it can't. But when the tribulation comes, as as it says in the book of Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ said, it will be unlike any time in the history of the world. So with that wonderful introduction, heartwarming Blood-curdling introduction. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45. Verse 40, at the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. So the end time here is certainly a reference to the tribulation period when the Antichrist is in full control. The reference here to the king of the south and the king of the north are new and have not been used in this section referring to the Antichrist thus far. The king of the south previously referred to the Ptolemaic or Egyptian forces, and the king of the north referred to the Seleucid, or for modern purposes we call it the Syrian forces. 
Whatever forces are in existence in the south and the north at the end time, that would be who Daniel is referring to here. Today, Egypt, which is the southern Ptolemaic power, still has quite a bit of sway in that area in the world, including the Arab bloc of nations. This leader will attack the Antichrist and most likely trying to stop the expansion of the Antichrist's kingdom. The reference to the king of the north has two possibilities. The first one is that this is the Antichrist himself, since he is a type of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was in his time the king of the north. The second view is that this is the leader of the present nation of Russia. It is unlikely that this is a depiction of the Antichrist since it is not used of him previous to this. Here in this section, he is simply referred to as the king. Following this line of reasoning, the king of the north designation is appropriate because his country, Rome, is not north of Palestine. Russia is directly north and has been noted by, as, and has, as has been noted by geographers, Moscow is almost on a, not Moscow, Idaho, but Moscow is almost a direct line north-south with Jerusalem. Comparing Ezekiel 38 and 39, which we just read, one notes several things that line up with this. This is aptly described by Leon Wood in his commentary. He says this, a great battle is described in these two chapters. And it must transpire during the tribulation. Also, the period during which the war set forth in our present verse occurs under verse 36. As several factors show, first, this war, it will occur after the Jews had returned to their land, Ezekiel 38, 8 and 12. Second, because it will be in the latter years, Ezekiel 38, 8, and in the latter days, Ezekiel 38, 16. Both phrases speaking of the tribulation period. Third, because it will be when the returned Jews are living in a sense of peace and safely. They were dwelling securely, the Scripture says, 3811, which could well be sometime during the three-and-a-half-year period of the peace covenant with the Antichrist. Remember, he will make a covenant of peace that will last three-and-a-half years, and then he will break it. <clears throat> and that's spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And fourth, because it must occur before Christ will have destroyed all of Israel's enemies, spoken of in Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19. For such an attack as here set forth could hardly take place after that. But this means that this battle must be closely related to, if not identical with, the conflict described in this verse. That's the battle in Ezekiel 38. Because this conflict, too, must be near the midpoint of the tribulation week, since the following verses in Daniel 11 tell of the Antichrist moving on into Palestine after this battle. And two two battles, totally different, could hardly transpire in so short a time and in the same general area. So the the Ezekiel 38-39 battle also involving the Jews, as noted. A close relation or identity between the two battles is argued also by the fact that a conflict in which a large nation like Russia would come against Israel when the Antichrist had a covenant with her, coming from Daniel 9.27, is hard to imagine unless the Antichrist would become involved at least to protect his own interests. The king involved in the battle of Ezekiel 38.39 can properly be identified with the ruler of Russia because his domain is said to be Magog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, verses 2 and 3 of Ezekiel 38. The names of peoples in the Old Testament time living in northern Mesopotamia and the Caucasus region of present-day Russia, (laughs) who, who, it is commonly accepted, migrated north into Russia to make up much of its populace. The identification is likely also because the country of this king of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is described as being in the uttermost parts of the north. 38.6, 15, and 39.2. Identifying him him with the north, even far north, in view of the uttermost parts, where Russia is. The stress on the north, it should be noticed, accords well with the thought and the designation of our verse, king of the north. A factor which argues for an identification of this northern king of Russia with the king of north, the north of our verse, is that this northern king allies himself with Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, which is put hut in the biblical text, verses five, verse 5 of Ezekiel 38, and also in verse chapter 30, verse 5, and in Nahum, verse 3, chapter 9. He identifies him, he allies himself with Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya in this battle, and these countries could represent the same Arab block of nations as possibly led by the king of our south, of the king of the south, as our text noted. So Wood also demonstrates that the grammar of this text points to the Antichrist that these two kings of the north and south come against. 
the North and the South come against the Antichrist. He says this, to these, two argu- to these arguments, two others of a different type may still be added. One is that on the basis of grammar, it is to be expected that the him of the phrases with him and against him of this verse should refer to the same person, which is true if both are taken in reference to the Antichrist. If they are, however, the sense of the verse forbids that he be identified with the king of the north. The other is that an identification of this king of the north with a Russian ruler makes good sense and fits contemporary history. Remember what we have talked about before. Those who live in this time will have an understanding. And so that's what we're looking at here. When the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel at the beginning of the tribulation period spoken of in Daniel 9.27, the Arab bloc of nations could be expected to seek Russia's help to intervene, lest all hope of obtaining the land be lost. Russia could be expected in turn to respond favorably in an attempt to offset the rising challenge of the Antichrist. The Antichrist with his ambitious plans would of course retaliate against such a rival alliance and the three-pronged struggle depicted here could indeed occur. Spoken of here in general in Daniel and spoken of specifically in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Finally, The weapons that are mentioned in this verse are of the kind used during Old Testament history. I'm I'm done reading Leon Wood, by the way. You didn't see the quotes, but they're there. Finally, the weapons that are mentioned in this verse are the kind used during Old Testament history. Ezekiel 38 and 39 do the same. They will be representative of their counterparts in modern warfare, for had Daniel given modern weapon designations, no one of his time would have understood it. He who will enter countries and overflow them is best taken again as the Antichrist, who is general, the general subject of this passage. This refers to Palestine, Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. He will achieve a great victory over these lands and will overflow as a river overflows its banks, the lands, and pass, th- by, uh, and pass through them on his way to Egypt, which we will see in verse 42. So these developments will begin in the first half of the 70th week predicted in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, with Israel at peace for the first three and a half years of the covenant of the covenant made with the Antichrist and then betrayed and openly attacked in the second three and a half years. The best understanding of the chronology of this section is that the battle in Ezekiel 38, 39 comes at a time of peace for Israel, 38, 8, 11, and 14, which would be the first half of Daniel's 70th week, when Israel has protection because of this short-lived covenant with the Antichrist, with the Roman ruler, with the Antichrist. At the midpoint of this time, the ruler becomes a world ruler, and the great tribulation begins in earnest with the persecution of Israel. Daniel 11, 36 through 39 refers to this second half and occurs after Ezekiel 38, 39. The battle described in verses 40 and on is a later development, most likely several years after the battle described by Ezekiel. This king, the one in previously in 36 through 39, is an absolute ruler and is a picture of a world government. The war in Daniel here is a rebellion against the king slash antichrist who breaks up the world government. As we will see in the verses following, the antichrist sweeps through the rebellious nations and dominates them until the second coming of Christ, the second advent. Comments, questions? Verse 41. He will also enter the beautiful land and many countries will fall. But these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Adam. So upon the victory over the two kings mentioned in verse 40, the Antichrist then sweeps into Israel, Palestine. Many will die, but he will not conquer Edom, Moab, and much of the the Ammonic territory. This happens in the last half of the tribulation period. The Antichrist will break his covenant with the Jews and devastate Israel. It's unfortunate, but that's how men work. They know how to kill very well. Being controlled by Satan, his desire to destroy Israel is well understood. Here, he will violate the treaty that he himself made with the Israelites. He will force the cessation of religious ceremony. We saw that earlier in Daniel. We saw that spoken of in other places. And he will erect his abomination of desolation in the temple, spoken of in Daniel 9.27. Again, those three countries to the southeast of Palestine, Jordan, will not be invaded. As far as the 
quote, foremost of the sons of Ammon, unquote, it appears the leaders of this area will somehow escape. Scripture doesn't tell us how or why, just that they will. Then verse 42. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. The Antichrist, not content with his recent conquerings, will then attack more countries. Heading southwest rather than southeast into Jordan, the Antichrist will attack Egypt. If this is the king of the south spoken of earlier, this country will have already been subdued, and it will remain for the Antichrist at this time to simply take possession of the country. Egypt will not be so fortunate to escape as the three countries mentioned in verse 41. Uh, We'll do 43, and then I'll see if there's any questions. Verse 43, but he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. This verse demonstrates the Antichrist in complete control of this area. He will gain control of the economies of this area and thus the valuables within them. And this is a very rich area of earth. The Libyans and Ethiopians will literally follow, quote, in his steps, unquote, which is the literal translation of this phrase. In other words, they will be part of his kingdom and they will obey his commands. I'm not saying willingly, but they will. It is important to remember at this junction that the Antichrist, though enabled by Satan, is still just a man. And no one is a match for the Lord Jesus Christ, especially a man. And he will have to occupy and maintain control in the countries he has subdued. This will thin out his forces, and as more and more nations rise against him, the situation for him will become more precarious. How many of you have ever played the game of risk? And I don't want to trivialize the Scripture. I I don't mean to do that. But if you've done that, you know what it's like when you have a certain amount of, of troops and you conquer more territories, and you've got to spread them out to control those territories. Um, Those nations know that. He's thinning out. Now might be the time. And so the Antichrist is headed for the final confrontation with the Lord Jesus Christ. But at this time, his position will begin to become more precarious. Any comments? I went through a couple of verses there. Or questions? Verse 44. But rumors... From the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. It's, it's, it's amazing to me how, how, how easily we are disturbed by rumors in our private lives. But in this particular case, it's going to be rumors, may or may not be true, that are going to cause him to change direction. While in North Africa, the Antichrist will hear rumors from the east and from the north. Nothing in Scripture gives us an indication of what the rumors are about, but they cause him great alarm. Some believe that this is the invasion of a 200 million man army from the east mentioned in Revelation 9.16, coming to challenge his world leadership. 200 million men. That's a relatively large army. The United States Marine Corps is about 180,000. Do the math. (laughs) Yeah, 200 million men. Okay, others believe it is only murmurs from Palestine indicating that the garrisons he left there to control that area have come under attack. At any rate, he returns in great, great fury and annihilates the cause of the rumors. This indicates that the 200 million man army interpretation is most likely unlikely. I'm not saying it's not, it's false. I don't know, but it's unlikely. It is very reasonable to postulate that he could put down an uprising of the Jews in Israel which is what I think it more likely is. is a, the Jews do not like this. They, do, they have never liked being subjugated. None of us like being subjugated. And it's likely, my view is that there was an uprising and he puts it down. Any questions before we hit this last verse? This is going to take a little bit of time. Okay, verse 45. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Now, Jenny, you write books. Would you call that an anticlimactic ending to that chapter? He, no one will help him. It'll be all over for him. Next chapter. I mean, I read that, and I read it again. I read it again. I said, God, really? <laughs> well, Scripture is specifically what we need to know. So this is what we need to know. And I got to thinking about it. The comparison between the power of Jehovah God and man, 
you can't compute the ratio because it's infinite to whatever men think they have. And so it's actually a good ending. The Lord just takes care of it. Achieving complete subjugation of Palestine again, the Antichrist will be able to put his headquarters wherever he wishes. The mountain indicated is most likely Mount Zion, where the temple was located. The seas are most likely the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. Zechariah 14.2 indicates that he will bring the destruction of Jerusalem, having brought also death or captivity to a huge number of the inhabitants of the land. I think in one of the, well, we'll see it later on, we see how many of the, of the Israelites are killed, and it's millions, millions of them die. Zechariah talks about two-thirds of them. Zechariah 14.2, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured. The house is plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. In an interesting, and I, here's what I worded this, I thought about it afterwards, but here's how I worded it when I first read this and thought it through. In an interesting divine anticlimactic statement, Daniel simply says that he will come to his end and no one will help him. This series of events will set the situation up so that Israel will embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And that's what's important about this. Israel is going to finally say they will look on him whom they have pierced and will be devastated for what they did, and rightly so. But for the grace of God, there go we. We, If I'd been standing in that crowd, I would have called out for his death too. So let's not get on our high horse over Israel. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. This verse chokes me up. <clears throat> And in righteousness, he judges and wages war in righteousness. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and slaves, small and great. By the way, I believe there's going to be horses involved in this final battle, based on that. There will also be tanks and and LAVs and and rockets and and etc. But you don't eat the flesh of a rocket, I, I don't think, unless you're an AI. Everybody knows what an AI is? Okay. Sometimes my, often my stuff, my jokes fall flat. Come assemble, he says, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's the anticlimax. It'll just be, I, I don't snap my fingers very well, but if I could, done, just done. Taken as a whole, Daniel eleven thirty six thirty five. 36, 35, excuse me, at this point, Christ the Messiah will come in and be victorious against the Antichrist in the valley of Jehoshaphat, east of Jerusalem. And the Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire, and his army will be destroyed by the sword that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever that is. No one exists who could help him against the fury of the second person of the Trinity. No one exists who could help him against the fury of the second person of the Trinity. Walverd summarizes this in his commentary. He says, taken as a whole, Daniel eleven thirty six through 45 is a description of the closing days of the times of the Gentiles, specifically, specifically the Great Tribulation with its world ruler, world religion, I see your hand, Peter, and materialistic philosophy. Go ahead. What's your question? It's his word. I'm just wondering how the mechanics... 
And I, you know, I'm not a strategist, so. In spite of its satanic support, Walvert says, the world government fragments into the sectional disputes and a great world war that climaxes with the second advent of Christ. This brings the times of the Gentiles to a close with the destruction of the wicked rulers who led it. Further details are added in the next chapter. That will be chapter 12, which is a short chapter, but just a marvelous chapter. It's the best chapter in the Bible. Well, no, 11 is. That's where we're at. To put this into something of a final summary... Um, I'll, I'm going to use a detailed paper that was not, not the whole paper, but s- uh, excerpts from a detailed paper which was put together by Dr. Thomas Ice. So Israel has been restored from the sword, Ezekiel 38, 8, 8. This would refer to Israel's defeats in A.D. 70 and in 135, 36 when the diaspora began, the diffusion began. They will be living securely in the land when the evasion takes place, 38, 8, to Ezekiel, This will be before the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation. Israel is not necessarily at peace with her neighbors, but is living in security, which means confidence. She has confidence. She's able to conduct commerce. She's able to secure her borders at this point in time. Her military might at this time is secured not necessarily a a completely peaceful existence, but a secure existence. (laughs) They will have been in the land for some time and will have produced great wealth which is one of the purposes, if not the main purpose, of the invasion by this alliance spoken of in Ezekiel 38. Important to the understanding of this section of Daniel chapter 11 is a statement by Ezekiel in his prophecy, which we just read, 39, 9 through 12. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will make fires of them. They will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires with the weapons, and they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. On that day, verse 11, I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will block off those who would pass by. So they will bury Gog there with all his horde, and they will call it the Valley of Hamangog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. The invasion will take place after the rapture, but before the tribulation. The rapture ends the church age, but does not start the tribulation. Once the Russian Antichrist, or whoever the Antichrist is, makes an agreement to protect Israel, as noted in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the stage will be set to begin the events of those seven years. It may be days, weeks, months, or years, but these events, these will be the events that presage the great end of all things. Ezekiel 39, 9 says, Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will make fires of them. This is explained as this way. If this battle takes place after the rapture, but before the 70th week begins, there would be ample time in the freedom of movement, even through the first half of the tribulation, the time of the pseudo-peace for Israel under the Antichrist covenant, to accomplish this job. Moreover, the statement about not needing to gather firewood from the forest in verse 10 would make more sense than after the first trumpet judgment when one-third of the trees were burned up. (coughs) If this battle were to take place at any point in the tribulation, the people would run out of time to complete the task before the intensified persecution of the final 42 months, Matthew 24. That drives the Jewish remnant into the wilderness to escape the satanic onslaught, Revelation 12, 6. While there is no reason why the burning weapons for firewood could not continue into the millennial kingdom, since during this time other weapons will be converted into peaceful and productive uses, Isaiah 2.4, the renewal of nature and increasing productivity of this age could argue against this necessity, and that's spoken of in Isaiah 27, Zechariah 8, and Micah 4. So this battle in Daniel takes place before the battle of Armageddon, which is intimated in the last, of verse, last phrase of verse 45, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. So the Lord will end the reign of the Antichrist. It's spoken of anticlimactically in the scripture because there's just no comparison between the power of Jehovah and the power of the Antichrist, a power of every army on earth. They're zero. A billion divided by zero is what? A trillion divided by zero is what? Yeah. So the power of Jehovah, and, and that should 
Does that not lend some comfort to your heart? It's, it's an exciting and encouraging thing to me. If we are in those times, look forward to some difficulties in the days to come. But always remember that our God writes and wrote the last chapter. So now, with that, are there any other questions before we go into the end times chronology? I think we can get through it all. We'll go through it quickly. But you have copies, including my misspelling of the word time. So let's just go through it kind of quickly. This is a pretty good end times chronology, and um, I got most of it from uh, compellingtruth.org end times. Yeah, I think they did a pretty good job of putting this together. So before the tribulation, there'll be the rapture, and then a break in time of intermediate indeterminate length. Yeah, my glasses. Then the first three and a half years of, of the tribulation. The Antichrist rises. The Antichrist makes peace with Israel and the world. The tribulation formally begins. Daniel 9, Deuteronomy 30. 144,000 Jewish witnesses preach the gospel. That's going to be incredible. <laughs> The Antichrist becomes ruler of the restored empire, Roman Empire, or speaking of the, what was it, the um, Ottoman Empire. An apostate, an apostate church comes to power. We have an apostate church today. And unfortunately, it's the one that dominates television. <clears throat> they are politically powerful and very wealthy, but completely wrong. They will persecute believers, this apostate church will, and will be centered in Rome, Revelation 17. Scattered throughout the first three and a half years are the seal judgments, which include the rise of the Antichrist, war. Did I put? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. Okay. I'll correct the online PowerPoint with the scriptures, the appropriate scriptures there. (laughs) So the first three and a half years are Revelation 6 through Revelation 8. War. Famine, pestilence, beasts, persecution of believers, and natural disasters. These grow in intensity, and they grow closer together and are compared to birth pangs becoming more intense, and they don't stop until they're completed. The seventh seal is silence for half an hour and the beginning or the distribution of the seven trumpet judgments in Revelations 5-6. This marks approximately the midpoint of the tribulation. The Jewish temple has been reestablished, as have the sacrifices, the Antichrist puts an end to those, Daniel 20, nine twenty seven. The treaty with Israel is broken, and Israel is invaded. The people of Israel gradually turn to God, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Two unnamed prophets preach in the streets of Jerusalem. The Antichrist is assassinated and resurrected. The apostate church is destroyed by the Antichrist, who demands unlimited worship of himself. Remember, he demands worship or you die. <clears throat> Similar to Antiochus Epiphanes, the Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation for worship in the temple. Michael and the other angels eject Satan from heaven, who then causes as much damage on earth as he possibly can. Then comes the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist rules the world. So I missed that. There it is, the midpoint of the Tribulation. Then comes the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist rules the world and his worship is God, Revelation 13. The false prophet, second beast, serves the Antichrist and establishes his worship in the temple. The world is convinced, the unregenerate world is convinced that the Antichrist is the Messiah, Revelation 13. The Jews come under horrible persecution. The Lord Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 24 and in Revelation 12 and 13, or 12, excuse me. The seven trumpets. Revelation 8 and Revelation 11. So destroyed crops creating famine. A third of the sea is turned to blood. A third of the fresh water is contaminated. A third of the sun, moon, and stars darkened. Locusts. The great destructive army destroys one third of mankind. This trumpet, the seventh trumpet announces Christ's oncoming reign and seven bowls, which are Revelation chapter 8. And I will include those. I guess I did include them there. The seven bowls, sores, seas turn to blood, fresh water turns to blood, sun heats up, supernatural darkness, the Euphrates dries up, and a great earthquake, and hundred-pound hailstones. In the end times. And that means the end, the credits begin rolling. 
the nation's revolt against the Antichrist and the battles leading up and finally to the Battle of Armageddon occur, Matthew 24 and Revelation 19. Two witnesses are killed and their bodies are left on the ground, left on the street. After three and a half days, they come back to life and are taken into heaven. <clears throat> Israel cries out for their Messiah and the Lord Jesus Christ returns. The sign of the Son of Man appears and the armies of the world join to fight Christ and he destroys them all with the word of his mouth, the sword of his mouth. The Antichrist and false prophet are destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire alive. Satan is bound and thrown into the abyss. Jewish believers from all over the world are gathered in their homeland, and the promised boundaries are literally restored. The word literally is open, o- overused today, but I literally mean literally today. Then there's, the end, uh, there's a break of 45 days to prepare for Christ's rule. We'll see that in Daniel chapter 12. The end time second wave of judgments occurs. <clears throat> Tribulation, surviving Gentiles grab, gathered near Jerusalem and separated into sheep, which will go into the millennial kingdom as mortals, and goats who are sent to hell, Joel 3, Matthew 25. The surviving Jews are gathered from all over the world and separated as the Gentiles were. Believers enter the millennial kingdom as mortals. Old Testament and tribulation saints are rewarded and given glorified bodies. And then in the end times, the millennial kingdom occurs, which is a literal thousand-year kingdom. There I use that word again, but spoken of in Scripture is a thousand years. Revelation 20 fulfills the promises made to Israel and establishes Jesus' dominion and sovereignty over the entire earth. Genesis 17, Isaiah 11, among others. Non-Jews are divided into nations with Jesus as their benevolent ruler. Disciples that were martyred for belief in Christ during the tribulation are given positions of leadership. With Satan bound and Jesus ruling, righteousness, peace, and joy abound. How else, what, how, what other could it be? Temple is rebuilt to greater glory than ever with sacrifices commencing as a memorial to Jesus' sacrifice. There's no need for sacrifices. His sacrifice was once for all as it teaches us in Hebrews. The curse on earth is lifted. There's peace in the animal kingdom, flowering deserts, no more sickness. Tribulation survivors will live long, marry, and have children. Those resurrected will live forever with glorified bodies. Then there's the last battle, the end time's last battle. Satan is released from the abyss and gathers people. I mean, what's with this guy? I mean, that's pride and and it's, it's a horrible thing. He gathers people to rebel against God. There's a short war. I don't know how short, but I'm thinking it's going to be really short. After which Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and his human army is killed. And then the final judgment, Satan and fallen angels are cast into the lake of fire forever. The heavens and the earth are destroyed. The great white throne judgment in which all unsaved, having not been found in the book of life, nor the book of works, will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And then finally, eternity, the end times, eternity. New heaven and new earth are created for God, by God for believers to live for in eternity. There's a 1,500-mile cubed Jerusalem city. That's even bigger than Chicago, I think. Yeah. Home to the Trinity, the angels, and the saved. No sin, no death, and finally, unhindered fellowship with Yahweh. So... Brothers and sisters, it's the time's coming. The beautiful time is coming. And it getting there will see some difficulty. But everything is planned precisely by Yahweh, by the sovereign God of the universe. There are no mistakes. Everything in Scripture will play out exactly as it has been portrayed. And that word that comes from that sword that comes from Christ's mouth, as Peter pointed out, that sword, the word of God, will have complete victory over everything. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.